get all the rich information and also so that we start recording and we never um, forget to turn it on because that would be a real tragedy, wouldn't it, Chris? Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, it's never uh, happened to you before. Yeah, though. it's never it's never really happened to me, but uh, I, I've heard it's happened, especially during podcasting. Um, it would be a real a real big shame out there. Uh, side note for any any anybody who's really saw through my uh, sarcasm there was the first podcast I did with Chris, or I think it was like the second version of it. <laughs> I forgot to. I forgot to hit record. So we had to redo everything once again. It was uh, a cup of coffee later and we just, we really, we were, we just leaned into it, Chris. That was the best one though, Adam. You know, there was, was. none better than that yeah. one. And, That's right. Yeah. That's right. And only, only you and I are, are the ones to enjoy it. So we're the special ones. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, we do have a pretty good, pretty good crowd right now. And I think one, one more just joined. Uh, and I would imagine, um, yeah, I would imagine a few people will be still trickling on in. Um, but for those who are say joining or for those who do come on, uh, we will have this available on YouTube later. We are recording this and it is, um, it's good to have everybody on here. So uh, please bear with me as I read just the background stuff to make sure that we've got everything in place as we get going here. And a few uh, kind of ground rules uh, to kind of get things going is everybody is muted right now. But if you click on chat at the bottom, you can pull up the right side view and you do have a raised hand option over there. And what that will do is if you raise your hand, once we get into the Q and A part of this, uh, that will indicate to me that you have a question. I'll unmute you, go ahead and ask the question and then we'll get into the answers of that. And so the way this will work is we have a panel of coaches, uh, coach Carmichael, uh, if you want to just kind of raise your actual hand and coach Renee Eastman, who will be a part of the Q&A, as well as myself, uh, Coach Adam Pulford. And we'll, we'll kind of cue things up and kick things off with a few uh, things that we're seeing with our athletes, uh, a few questions that we've been fielding uh, kind of over and over throughout the pandemic. And we'll start there and then open it up to the rest of the, the community here that is <laughs> still, still hopping on. So. Uh, with that being said, we're about five minutes over the noon hour, and we will try to wrap this thing by one o'clock. So um, with that being said, Chris, would you like to start us off with some of the things that you have been seeing in Colorado, as well as uh, all over the nation, all over the world, as it pertains to uh, athletes training and maybe some vision behind this? Thanks, uh Thanks, Adam. Um, well, um, like just about everybody I, that's live, this is the first pandemic that um, we've been through. Uh, you know, one thing that, that um, initially as this kind of hit and the, the sheltering at home started to, to take place with a lot of the athletes that, that I've been working with, um, there was a lot more available time to train, um, and the athletes were, were really motivated to, to um, get out there and use that time before they were really time crunched. And, uh, and it was, they were always kind of squeezing in their workouts. Um, but what really started to become uh, apparent over uh, few days is just sort of the, the emotional uh, wear and tear of everything that was going on in the world. And um, uh, we all kind of got for a while there glued to the, the TV and, and, uh, and it really kind of started to hit everybody just how serious this was. And, um, and, um, 
you could you could feel it with I could feel it in coaching athletes their um, their motivation and their sort of emotional well being was definitely uh, impaired by what was going on and so I started to shift the training um, away from really kind of performance base um, and 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 uh, and focus kind of first and foremost on improving performance and, and really made a shift to um, first and foremost health and and um, that sounds I would like to think we never uh, put health second uh, to performance but um, during this time there was there was uh, clearly as I said we athletes were impaired by just the emotional wear and tear of being able to get out there and hit it hard on the bike um, and then um, come back in and recover because of just the, the, the isolation they were feeling, um, the fact that some of their support system wasn't there. Some of it was, some of it wasn't. Um, the things that they were hearing and reading um, in the news was slowly sort of bringing them their emotional and energy level down and their ability to recover from a workout I could clearly see was starting to be impacted by it. So that shift uh, away from performance to health, I think it, it allowed, um, it took some of the pressure off and uh, you know, we still get out there and, and work out and exercise, but I've avoided kind of putting too much uh, training stress on athletes, mainly not, not all, but, but some um, just, it was, they weren't gonna be able to um, get a positive response from that training stress. And, and uh, so I would say that's one thing that I've adjusted with, with some of the athletes that I work with. That is, now that I'm unmuted. Um, no, that's great insight, Chris. And also real similar with um, kind of a tactic that I've utilized with, with a lot of my athletes and what we've talked about on uh, the podcast as well, the Train Right podcast. So Renee, I will cue you up next with um, some of the insights or maybe some of the techniques that you've been using with your athletes or some of the questions that you've been fielding um, on your end. Uh, thanks, Adam. Um, I think what Chris said, I experienced with a lot of my athletes, you know, taking the pressure off um, training um, for the reasons of, yeah, adapting to the training, the additional stress of the pandemic. But then, you know, no one has an immediate race to get ready for. Because, um, you know, events in the in the at least the short term have been canceled and perhaps even the long term and the question that um i have to answer for myself and have to you know help my athletes with is well what now you know what now uh my a race is it, for the first half of the season's gone i don't know if i'm gonna have my second race um and I think like with Chris, um, you know, kind of the, the answers can come back to health and, you know, the, the question to come back to is, well, why are you doing this in the first place? And I think actually um, um, Jason Coops, I see him on this call, his article this week was a pretty good one. Like, what's your why? Why are you doing all this? And I think when I get to that with my athletes, like they're, they're not out to win the world championships or the, you know, tour Flanders or, you know, not getting paid to do this professionally. Most people have started this journey of becoming a cyclist because they really enjoy being fit. They enjoy riding their bike. And then the events are just something to put on the calendar as like an end point for the training like well well i like riding my bike well how long am i going to do it or how hard am i going to do it and then ben can I identify that so it's been coming up with some different goals for people 
that they can maybe pursue without having an event. Um, Cause all of my athletes want to train anyway. They like that regularity of the training program and they identify as an athlete. And so having that, you know, regular schedule, um, but just the having a why can help, you know, direct. So, you know, some of the ideas um, that I've pursued with my athletes are like focusing on weaknesses or better balance with their strength, with their uh, training programs to maybe like go back to some strength training, you know, we do a lot of strength training in the winter. Now it's springtime, but you know, there, there's more time maybe available to do some strength training. Um, or coming up with some, you know, maybe more creative goals, you know, number of feet in a week or number of miles in a week or Strava segment goals or 20 minute power goals. So um, what I'm finding is just the, a new way of creating goals that aren't necessarily event-based um, for, for my athletes. Yeah, that's, that's great, Renee. And I, and I think that I, I'm a big, I'm a, I'm a big asker of why, uh, and <laughs> where a lot of this starts from, if anyone wants a, a good book to read during the pandemic is start with why by Simon Sinek. And that may be, I haven't read Coop's article yet, but I will in that he may reference that or not, but that, that is a good one. And I think for those struggling, uh, with why the heck am I doing this whole endurance thing? Um, is it the racing? Is it something more? Go ahead and read that book and, and try to answer that question. I think that's good. Meanwhile, the short-term motivational aspect of, well, there's no event right now it may come down the road. Yeah. I've been, I've been utilizing the, the Strava segments and, you know, as well as like getting some personal bests uh, with my athletes too. But the kind of the bigger thing that I've been um, working with my athletes on as well as communicating on, ver on various, various podcasts is for those athletes who let's, let's face it, who are kind of the lucky ones, which I would imagine is a lot of us here and, and perhaps many of us listening to this recorded podcast, but the people who are uh, working from home furloughed have time, perhaps, you know, maybe, maybe a decrease in the income, but, or maybe no change and they have more time to train and more time to focus on the bike or stress out about the bike or something like this. Many of my athletes are in that situation. Luckily, some people aren't, and that's, that's unfortunate. So I don't want to overlook um, kind of the pain that this is causing on a lot of people, but to focus back to uh, the people who do have this time right now, that's the opportunity. And I think if we look at that in terms of an opportunity, both as professional athletes and professional people, um, there's an opportunity there. And the opportunity is that <laughs> they have the time, time to deepen and broaden their fitness or time to, as Renee said, time to work on some of their, uh, their weaknesses. And so the deepening and broadening of the aerobic base is something that I would say pretty much every master's level athlete or amateur athlete needs to work on anyway. So the way I, the way I look at my training of an athlete and I did a, I did a presentation for uh, Coop and, and some runners is I separate fitness and performance separately. Fitness is training to, to get fit training to tolerate more. Right. And there's various ways to do that. You just, you want to, increase what we call, uh, your, your, your training load or your CTL. And at some point we then switch to some high intensity to bring out specificity and performance and performance, meaning 60 minutes or less in a, in an effort running, uh, swimming, biking, that kind of, that kind of thing. And right now what I'm talking about is building big fitness and a good way to do that is, is aerobic riding and medium hard training that, goes back to what Chris was talking about that doesn't induce too much fatigue or doesn't cost the athlete too much in terms of compromising the immune system. Meanwhile, because we're minimized in our uh, other variables in life, meaning the, the commutes, the work stress and all this kind of stuff, hopefully is we have less things uh, 
it, it, costing us that that overall fatigue so we can essentially do more in that training or run our training programs out longer to deepen and broaden that fitness base. And I know it's a, perhaps a little hard to conceive some of what I'm talking about just here on a Zoom call without some fancy slides and things like that. But conceptually, uh, that is something that I've been working with my athletes uh, to develop more of that aerobic base so that when the races do come, which they will, may not, may, maybe not in 2020, maybe the end of 2020, perhaps in 2021, um, but we're, we're ready. You know, we're ready and, and we're, we're stronger uh, than ever. You know, and, and I think that through that process as well, I think you'll, uh, you might get a few more insights on your why. I think you might get a few more insights on why you actually love to train, ride your bike, go for a run. And it may not be as event heavy as, as you thought, or maybe it is. And, and I think it's, uh, there's no right or wrong in that. But I think the awareness in, in being in tune with what you love about the process, that's, that's more important. So, um, well, with that being said, Chris, would you like to add anything? Uh, um, one thing I've been doing uh, with um, a couple of athletes I work with is uh, um, basically unplugging them and uh, having them ride without uh, any sort of measuring device. Um, and basically, and I'm doing this on the days that are um, what, what I would consider when we're increasing the intensity of the training. Of the training. And, and one of the reasons I'm, I'm doing that is to um, kind of it helps to take some of the pressure off that athlete from a, from a performance standpoint of, you know, everything's always highly measured typically. And um, one of the things by, by I'm plugging is I'm kind of building in some of that old school type of training where it's more around um, what's going on in when you're out there actually on the road. And, and I only do this when they're out there on the road. It's not done when they're training indoors. Um, you're doing more um, sprint work and things that tie into landmarks. Um, and uh, environmental conditions like tailwind sprints, headwind sprints, crosswind sprints, being able to look over, uh, and getting really comfortable on being able to look behind you as you start your sprint, um, and then always keeping your, your eyes uh, fixed up to the horizon where you're going to end, and it might be going and doing some, you know, um, two telephone poles on and one off type type sprints um and uh i find it it gets them it adds a lot more of that fun back into sort of the, the training process remove some of the performance anxiety or, or stress of how is that actually you know was my power up from this workout or this particular interval or something like that and we try to build back in some skills and sort of uh uh, be more in tune to what's going on environmentally out on the road, whether if you've got a, if we're doing roughly 200 meter sprints, if you've got a tailwind, well, that 200 meters is going to come much quicker. It's going to take you a lot less time to travel that 200 meters. So, how hard do you start the sprint? Do you kick it in? A lot of little things that we are trying, that I'm trying to build in to some of these athletes while unplugging them from basically all measuring devices on this particular workout. And I found that they've responded really well to it. I don't know whether I will you know, continue that once this is lifted and some events are, are coming back, but it was really kind of fun to get back and the athletes enjoyed it, to get back to being sort of unplugged a little bit and and focusing on other things that can influence uh, performance, um, but not necessarily the fitness-based side to it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. That's good. That's good, Chris. Um, 
and we're having a bit of an echo. So I, I do apologize for <laughs> the, the echo situation. But yeah, to Chris, to your point, I'm a huge fan of Zwift, but you can't achieve that uh, writing virtually. And I think it's a, it's a missed art of sorts that you can do it. You can do it solitude. You can do it alone. Um, and, and feeling the wind and feeling that crosswind and around here, uh, it's kind of funny. I had a text message from a bunch of the guys I ride with and it was a group text and it was like, Hey, are we still out there sprinting for town signs? <laughs> and it just like blew up, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, I'm still doing, I'm still sprinting and all this. And, and to Chris's point, it's like, yeah, don't, don't forget to have the fun factor, um, throughout all this, throughout all the, you know, riding solo and getting, uh, you know, overly focused on all the widgets, gadgets, numbers, algorithms, and blah, blah, blah out there. Um, don't forget it's still a bike and we can ride it and smile at the same time. So, uh, Renee, anything else you wanted to add to that before we uh, transition to the Q&A portion of this? No, I, I think uh, yeah. a good point solved all around. Okay, great. Well, uh, so now let's get into the Q&A. And as I said before, I can see the participants on the right-hand side. And if you do have a question, feel free to raise your hand, pre uh, press the raise hand button, uh, and I will unmute you and we can go for it. If you feel more comfortable uh, typing something into the chat uh, box where uh, Mr. Bradley Huff and Renee have been dialoguing a bit, uh, feel free to do that as well. And I will read the question and uh, the coaches and myself will do our best to answer. So. Let me kind of toggle back and forth here. Uh, come on, Huff. I know you got a question about something out there. You always have questions for me. Fire away, buddy. It's free here in Zoom land. Okay. So we do have a raised hand. Let me get to it here. For whatever reason, I am not seeing that raised hand. Christopher Green. Hey, Adam, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Yes. Great. Thanks. Um, Perfect. So, you know, I, I think as a community, especially of athletes, and, and first of all, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm getting to be a senior athlete. I just turned 50. So thanks for all the help from you guys. Um, as a community of athletes, I think we do a fabulous job of tracking data when it comes to our specific workouts. Um, we're great about things like power and GPS location, elevation, heart rate, all that kind of stuff. But can you guys, considering the state of the pandemic right now, um, and maybe a lot of the, the scarier things like people being asymptomatic when they may have COVID-19, um, are there suggestions you guys can give us about how to kind of monitor our, our individual health more analytically outside of general training so that we know when we're sick or kind of have good indicators when we're sick and don't start down a training path where we could kind of go backwards in our training because we're starting to work out while we're either sick or getting sick? That's a solid question. Uh, coaches, would you, either of you like to take that one on first i'll chime in okay. uh, uh, using more technology that we have available nowadays like with the whoop straps and there's a couple other ones garmin has one fitbit you know monitoring sleep heart rate variability resting heart rate um even just taking your morning pulse resting heart rate in you know tracking your sleep tracking your mood um can give you some you know real insights to your health and if you're whether you're you know worried about like health virus wise or health training wise um i found it to be uh for my athletes and even personally like a really nice advancement with the Did you hear the end? I, I, I think I might cut out. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Renee. I heard that. 
Renee, I actually didn't hear the very tail end of that, if you wouldn't mind repeating. Um, if I remember, it was just the, 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 the wearables and monitoring, you know, simple things like morning pulse and sleep, um, even temperature. Um, at this point can give you some really good indications of your health status. Um, you know, that ba real basic like morning heart rate and it's elevated, there's some, there, often there's something up. Um, and I think good practices, whether or not you're, it's just the health and, and you know, concern about the pandemic now, just training in general. Um, you know, in WHOOP in, in particular, that data syncs with your training peaks. So your coach can see your data too, which is uh, another nice feature of that particular monitor. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Chris, uh, anything to add to that? Yeah, I'm a big proponent of uh, sort of the, the mental um, outlook that the athlete has is really, um, I can tell a lot just in, in, in this is when I'm, I'm working with an athlete, I can tell really quickly how the athlete's feeling just by a, a conversation and their, um, their fatigue level, things like that generally is, is I develop that relationship. It's pretty easy to see, um, you know, are they starting to show signs of fatigue and, and uh, through, that, through that discussion and through asking them some really specific questions. And they have a saying in Belgium where you have a good head, you have good legs. And uh, they, uh, they always say, if, you're, if your outlook, if your uh, uh, mental sort of uh, impressions are, are good, generally you get on the bike, your legs follow. And so I tend to, veer more towards the uh, sort of the emotional and, and mental outlook as helping determine, um, you know, where an athlete is and how they're responding to the training. And also obviously looking at the, the various technology that's out there, whether it's, um, whether it's power meters and things like that. But um, I, I found that if I've ever discounted an athlete's sort of mental impressions on how the training's going, I've generally made a mistake in their training prescription. Yeah, that's, that's really solid advice, Chris. And um, I think Christopher Green, I think he was the one that did ask this question. Um, Christopher, I, I think, you know, in summary, you know, what the, what myself and these two coaches are saying is, you know, there's, when we're actually coaching, you know, we're looking at various, various things to keep track on overall fatigue, health, wellness, the immune system, these types of things. Um, I think it is interesting to have the technology available to look at uh, like heart rate variability, like Renee was saying, um, and some other things that I'll talk about uh, here in, in just a second. But like where we're at with the technology and say within coaching, and, and this is kind of the takeaway is... Um, it, I haven't seen a, a piece of technology that answers that question in its multimodality and it's human to human communication. That's going to be the best indicator of that. And for, for more about that, uh, another, here's another good resource too, is uh, I, I did a podcast with Christy Ashwanden and her book, good to go. And she goes deep into uh, a lot of the research behind trying to figure out, you know, if you're sick, if you're underperforming, what you know, all this kind of stuff. But in the end, mood and motivation are the still the biggest indicators of something is awry here. Like if mood is low, uh, if mood is bad, if motivation is low, that's that's when you know the red flags go up. When I see those red flags go up, when I'm hearing the mood, when I call an athlete, like Chris was saying, and I can tell something is up, normally it's because they had poor sleep or they're, say, you got something wrong in the training, meaning, and then what I look at is I look at ramp rates of fatigue. In, this is in training peaks and WKO5 and some other things, but basically 
how fast are we accumulating training fatigue? And normally when the mood is bad, training fatigue has been induced pretty rapidly or their recovery has not been normal, meaning it's been lacking. And so right now, I think that the, the mood and the tuning into the motivation, the overall awareness is the number one thing. Number two, then look at the kind of the quantifiable aspects of that. But I haven't seen anything else in terms of a, a wearable or a blood indicator or something like this in a acute or short time period to indicate that you are uh, compromising your health. So um, along with that, a question did roll in here kind of along those lines is, uh, how do you tell the difference between lack of motivation versus fatigue when it comes to deciding whether to train today to push through or take a day off? Uh, Coach Renee, I'll, I'll cue that one up for you. Do you want me to read it again? I got it. Thanks. Okay. Um, I, I think that you can't unconnect those two. The, that the, Lack of motivation um, can uh, be a manifest of uh, you know lack of recovery or need for need for more recovery. How's that? Need need, yep. need for additional recovery. And um, it was funny because it was in a USA Cycling article this week, and it really bugged me where the author was like, "Just pull up your bootstraps and do it anyway." <laughs> and my response was like, "Stress is stress." If you've had um, a terrible day at work or you're really like stressed out during this pandemic and you're worried about the health of your family and paying the bills and so on and so forth, you can't handle as much stress from training because you have all this stress from other things in your life that it all goes together. You can't just say, oh, well, I didn't train hard yesterday. I should be recovered so i'm going to go hard because i'm just a wimp and that's why i'm not motivated because if you're not motivated it's a sign it's a sign that things need to change and it's often needing to have more recovery in your life and i think what people discount a lot of times is the impact of other things in your life that aren't riding your bike or running or whatever your sport is that impact your ability to handle a, a, a workload. So I think if you are suffering from lack of motivation, um, that's worth examining. Um, I think they're on a you know side to that. Um, uh, author Brad Stolberg's quote this week was: "Depression hates a moving target." Maybe you don't need to train today, but I would encourage you to still move today. You know, get out there, go for a walk, get some sunlight on your face, or maybe you don't train, but you just go for a bike ride and see if that turns your mood and motivation around. Because, you know, I don't want to say it's always that there's additional stress in your life. You know, sometimes, you know, you just need to to move a little bit, um, but I'll stick with my first sentiment of, if you're not motivated, there's a sign of, usually there's a sign of bigger things going on. Yeah, in, in just a quick little snippet on that, Renee, one thing I tell my athletes is um, take action before emotion. Meaning if you have this emotional thing of, you know, lack of motivation, all this kind of stuff, say, just start riding. Like forget the workout for the, just start riding, warm up, do a few openers maybe, and then decide, you know, assuming all the other parameters are in place like you talked about, but action before emotion sometimes gets that going. Uh, Chris, any, um, anything on the motivation versus fatigue? How do you know when one is, one is the other? Well, um, if an athlete's not motivated, that's a really bad sign, a bad sign in the sense of, you know, you're, you're really not going to get much from the athlete from a, from a training standpoint. And, and I, I believe that motivation comes from within the athlete. It, it's not something a coach can do is, is motivate the athlete. I think the coach can inspire the athlete. And then hopefully that 
then they get the motivation to go out and turn that into something. But I find um, that I, I don't, I, I keep the two separate. I don't motivate athletes. I try to inspire athletes. And then they get the motivation to go out there and, and, and execute on the training or, or their competition or whatever they're, they're trying to achieve. But um, it's, uh, you know, athletes that we work with, at CTS, they're all, you know, um, some of them are elite athletes, they're going to the Olympic Games or uh, World Championships, uh, but they're all athletes and they're all generally um, very motivated and motivated individuals as athletes and motivated in their career, motivated in their life. So um, typically when motivation has dropped, there's a, you have to ask yourself why why is the motivation down and and uh, I usually find that it's usually there's not one answer it's a multitude of things some of it can be from um, hard training some of it can be from external stress factors that um, it's hard for them to kind of clear their mind to find that motivation to go out and execute. And, and, and I find it's better to just take those days and just scrape them away and just say, hey, let's, let's just go out and ride or let's, let's take the day off. Or like Renee said, do a, do a walk or a hike or something like that. But if, you're, if, you're, if an athlete's forcing themselves through it um, and they don't really have the motivation, they're probably not gonna get much from it. And I think that I always try to, um, remind the athlete, if you're, if you're doing a hard workout, there should be some benefit that's going to be coming from that workout once you've allowed yourself to recover. And so what, what is that benefit supposed to be? So if it's just simply to train hard, you know, there'd be a lot more world champions out there if it was just all it came down to was hard training. And uh, it's, it's more complex than that. And motivation is... Uh, is from within the athlete. So if, if the motivation isn't there, then let's do something else right now. It'll yeah. come back. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree with that. And, and I think as I, you know, look at this too, in terms of how I coach an athlete, when say this comes up is I go back to the basics. I, I look at or analyze if you have the data, um, the recovery or the sleeping aspect, you look at the fatigue induced, and you ask yourself, okay, does it make sense that fatigue would be an issue right now or is it true motivation, right? Then you get on the phone and then you start talking about all the other things. I call it life stress. You know, we, in, in, tra in coaching and training, we call, call it training stress, TSS. And I always say, well, how's, how's the LSS, right? Because it all goes into the same bucket. It's hard to, right now, we don't have the technology really to separate it out. And so I think, you know, us coaches – <laughs> we use phones and, and words uh, to help separate that out and then instill into the athlete a game plan to move forth, go forward, be it take a nap, take a rest day, or just ride your bike or, hey, you know what, get out and do a few sprints and see what happens. So um, I, I would always say, you know, look at the data, look at the, look at what you know to be true and then ask yourself kind of within, it's like, okay, if, if I'm just truly unmotivated, is it just kind of like the, you know, the, the voice kind of within that's telling me that I'm un, unmotivated or that I am fatigued because the data is not suggesting it. So let's go out and let's just move for a little bit, figure it out. A good question for sure. Um, next question is coming from Chris Taylor and it is, how would you make training adjustments for junior riders? The group is 13 to 16 years old and road race and uh, cyclocross at a high level. All right, so Renee, I'll, I'll go to you first again. How would you make adjustments uh, right now for junior riders during the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, yeah, I was not sure if this was a, a during this particular time or just a very broad question, so. Um, Let's just assume during this time period, um, and Chris Taylor, if you want to add in any specifics, uh, go for it. But yeah, how, how would you, and, and here's to frame this up maybe a little bit further is a lot of the athletes that I work with that have kids, 
um, you, you know, it, it, it is challenging because everybody wants to ride with their, with the friends, right? They're very socially active and, and may, maybe they don't understand the full impact of it, but it's, uh, you have a lot of the identity issues. You have a lot of the, I need to go hard and crush things all the time. Um, and in everybody was gearing up for racing, uh, kids included. So how it, you know, how would you Renee as a coach, uh, adjust for this time period for junior uh, racers? It's a good question. And, and I would probably take some similar approaches that I would do with the, the adults of, well, for the immediate, the, the events are off the table. You know, there's nothing for the next month, probably next two months. Um, and you're just talking about, yeah, kids, yeah, well, a lot, not just kids, but you know, a lot of people just want to hammer and go, go, go. And I'd say probably a little bit more so in the, in the junior ranks, um, and getting them to probably be able to maybe do some other stuff right now. Just, you know, like I was, I'm doing with some of my other adult athletes, um, uh, to take the pressure off of you gotta be ready and you gotta go because that like pressure cooker is gonna be enough when the racing resumes. And I think in particular for kids in that age group um, to keep it more fun and more broad based of fitness, go for a hike, go for a run, go play horse with your brothers and sisters, like just be active. Um, as opposed to having to train. Um, get, cause you know, get, give a kid six weeks and, or a month notice, they'll be fine. They're kids, they have years to progress. Probably more important that they, you know, are able to um, just have fun and stay engaged right now than have to train. And I think that's like a broad, uh, recommendation for that age group is to focus less on training and more on just ride your bike and have fun. Um, as long as they're able to go out and ride their bike, depending on where they are and if it's safe and all that. Yeah. Yeah, no, good points. Chris, anything to add to that? Yeah. You know, um, I was a kid one time and, uh, um, I started bike racing when I was nine years old and I was really fortunate because I rode with uh, a, um, we had a coach and um, he did a lot of skill work with us. And, um, and some of that, and, and I would highly recommend that in that band that um, Chris Taylor, um, his question 13 to 14 year olds, um, really kind of uh, trying to have some of the focus on skill work because you don't have the the stimulus of group rides that you can do and things like that but but there's a lot of skill work that you can do by yourself um and really learning to um whether it's putting water bottles down on the ground and and riding by and being able to reach down and pick them up really being comfortable and having a lot of agility um on the bike um is is important I can't emphasize enough of that learning those things when you're young um, because they, it will save you an extreme amount of energy as you go up the ranks and move into the into a, a larger peloton if you know how to follow a wheel correctly if you if you're comfortable on your bike having that um, agility to be able to uh, move around ob obstacles, set up obstacles in your, in your front uh, yard, in your driveway, um, doing a lot of this kind of skill work um, is important. How to be able to, uh, you know, start off when you start off with, with clipping in without looking down at your pedal, um, reaching down for your water bottle and not looking down to where your water bottle is your water bottle, since you bought that bike, the water bottle hasn't moved. I guarantee that. You should be able to reach down and grab the bottle while keeping your eyes straight up and pedaling and bring it up and then put it back down. That's a skill that you need to have 
and those are things that you should be learning um, best or best served when you're when you're young and learn those skills when you're young and it will give you an extreme it'll save you a lot of watts as you grow older and start to integrate into the peloton so i would emphasize skill work um, i would i would uh, also recommend um, really un unless a coach is working directly with you staying away from riding indoors more than twice a week um, i find there's a lot of additional stress that comes from the indoor Zwift type rides, especially if you're doing group rides or races or things like that, that's different, a different type of stress than what you get when you're riding outdoors. So focus on skills, no more than two days a week, indoor, hard um, Zwift style rides. Yeah, that's that, that's all really good stuff. And in kind of the last part that I will throw in there, I'm glad you said that, Chris, because um, what I'm finding through, through my athletes is, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, that junior kid, they want to race, right. And they want the social interaction. So Zwift is a great way to do that. I think that any kid of that age, that's super into it and super into racing, they are prone to overdoing it. And so that's why there needs to be some regulation on there. I think to Renee's point, keep it fun, get them outside. Uh, also keep them safe, like high speed technique stuff, maybe not be the best thing to do right now, but you know, go on to, so trainride.com. We've, uh, we have the quarantine project going on and Josh Whitmore's rolling out some content on um, technique skills and drills that you can do by yourself. And if you're if Chris, I think it was that asked this question. Um, you know, if you don't know anything about skills and drills, um, go there, F find some that you can just go out to a field and, and go with your kid, you know, get on the bike yourself and do it. Uh, YouTube some, you know, again, safe, you know, low speed skills and drills to really work on that technique and just make it fun. Like practice with a track stand. Like every kid loves to just play on a bike, do a track stand, pop a wheelie, you know, and just truly have some fun with it. And then if you shape it up in a week, you know, every other day is a Zwift ride. Every other day is a technique ride where you're out rolling around in the grass. And meanwhile, play some soccer out there too. Um, but I'm very excited right now because Mr. Brad Huff does have his hand up. So let's, let's check in with him. Hey guys, can you hear me? Okay. So um, going on the um, emotional side and the motivation side that both Renee and Chris talked about, how do you as a premier coaching group help athletes understand it's okay to fail at this time because they don't have the normal racing performances to gauge a performance and understand that getting 96th place is okay. Uh, how do you help them to understand it's okay to fail in a given workout or a given day right now and help them understand that it's it's part of the plan and you are developing for the future as we come out of this time. Renee, I'll cue it up to you first. Um, that's a good, a very good question, Brad. And um, I, I suppose it's something I continually work on and have to, um, you know, often guide my athletes through that, you know, especially just in the general sense for training, you kind of have to have some failure, um, if you want to use that term failure, um, because that means that you've achieved overload. Like, I always have to, you know, emphasize to my athletes, if you, if you are always like 100% capable of doing every workout, I know I'm not giving you enough because we haven't gotten to the limit yet. You know, so the only way to get past your limit is to, you know, put, to push you to it and just a little bit over it. Um, so it's um, just, I think, education and talking to them and, and talking about it and how you frame, um, you know, that workout where they couldn't do the last interval or um, the event where they got dropped or whatever. Um, that that's where the most growth comes from, is from uh, either pushing past your limit physically or getting into something that's a little bit above your head, um, you know, maybe tactically or 
skill wise or things like that. But I think it's just the, the framing it correctly, probably um, even before they get into that workout to talk about, you know, um, expectations and things like that. Well, and, and to maybe not put it on failure, but more so like how do you help them with their learnings from each day on that plan is maybe a better way to look at it on instead of saying failure, because no one likes the word failure. But I, I love the word failure. Yeah, every race, there is going to be a failure and we're going to learn that. But how do you help them understand the process that we're all in right now, that it's okay, you know, we're going to stumble, we're going to have difficulty, but each day we keep motivating and staying focused, we can come out of this. That's kind of where I was going. Well, yeah, that would be maybe the, the question back to them is, okay, well, if you weren't successful this time, you know, Oh, what, like just the question back, well, how could you have done better? What could you have done differently? You know, and then you gotta go through the, the, the list of, you know, did you eat enough, drink enough, sleep enough? Um, was your mind in the right place? You know, some of these workouts are really hard. <laughs> like you have to be really focused to get through the workouts or the event or, or whatever it is. Um, so it's, it, it's asking the athlete, what did you learn or what can you do differently next time? Or what maybe, what, uh, maybe exposes a area of fitness to work on. Um, that's what I do. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Chris, anything to add to that? Well, I'll just, I'll start first with um, um, the latest podcast with uh, coach Jim Miller and, uh, and Kate Courtney um, that, you, Adam, hosted. Uh, they discussed this quite a bit and um, some really good insights. You know, uh, I think first and foremost is we all lose so much more than we win, even the very best. You know, we're always going to lose and 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 fail so much more than we succeed. But really, it's it's through those. Through that fail is where we learn generally the most. You know, when we succeed, it's I think it's important to go through and have that mental recall. But it's you know you, you accomplished, you you won, or you were you, you met your goal, and it's pretty easy to go. Okay, I did this. Is it doesn't necessarily stick with you, but when it when you don't succeed and and you you don't win. Um, and you do that recall, you dig in a lot deeper. You know, the, the, the coach should be digging in deeper, the athlete should be digging in deeper, and there's so much more to learn. And I think that's an important element is like, we, we just, it, it's a process and it's all about learning and being better than what you were before. And, you know, kind of striving that whole Zen aspect of striving for perfection. We're never going to achieve perfection because it's it's not achievable but it's doing it a little bit better than what you did before um and uh i think uh coach jim miller said something that i thought was a great quote is um we we all fail but that doesn't make us a failure and uh being a failure is very different than failing you know and and we're all going to fail many times and as long as we're learning and building back from that and trying to not repeat the same things, then we're moving forward. And then we're not a failure. And uh, uh, one of my first coaches um, would always say that the, the failure is not to try and uh, to not put yourself out there. And, and that's where the real failure is to, is to, not, is to not try. I was literally just going to say those words, Chris, like that, that is, that is truly where you fail. And I think to Renee's point, you, ha you need to bring some context into what success is, what failure is. And when we were talking with, when I was talking with Kate, even before like the episode in terms of what to talk about, um, she's like, I'm stoked. You know, we have more time before Tokyo, right? 
uh, we have more time to go back and do those workouts where, where I did fail, where I, where I didn't produce the power or achieve the goals that Jim put forth in place. So I have more time to improve. And so I think it's that, you know, it's the learning, it's the awareness, it's the mindset of which you approach these challenges and opportunities by that ultimately is the driver of success or the view of failure. Um, and so it's a great question, Brad, um, and, and uh, really dove deep on, on that one. And that might be a good, uh, good place to put a pin in it, though, because we are coming up to that one o'clock uh, time period. And, but I will throw it out there and ask if anyone has a, a quick dying question that you want to throw out to these coaches while uh, we have their attention, go for it. And if not, I, I'm sensing that we, we may have to do this again because we, um, there's, there's even a few questions that I'm leaving a little bit in, in the uh, dialogue box that kind of touched on a few of the things that we're doing, but a lot of curiosity out there. So this is good. This was fun. I, we've, uh, we've, this is our first time doing this sort of Zoom uh, call or conference. We've done webinars before and, um, you know, we're all getting to be pros in Zoom these days. And, and uh, so we'll, we'll probably introduce more of these over the next, uh, over the next few weeks. And uh, I appreciate everyone coming and and uh, joining in and I'd like to thank uh, our marketing director, uh, Corey, uh, for helping set it up. And then of course, Coach Adam and Coach Renee, thank you uh, as well. Excellent. Well, just to be a little silly here, Chris, but one last question from, of course, uh, Mr. Huff. Does Bill, Walton, does Bill Walton have the most joy riding his bike of any athletes we work with? You know, Bill, he really does. I mean, the bike is his coach, and, and that's what he says all the time. And that's, yeah. that's where he goes in and, and finds his, his peace. And um, he would do the Tour of California with us when, when that was going on in our sort of race experience. And, and, uh, and he would basically ride it, you know, start to finish um there were long days out there with him he doesn't ride very fast but i'll tell you um we would rotate coaches to to ride with bill each each day would uh, another coach would would ride with bill and and sometimes it'd be a 10 11 12 hour day 13 hour day out there on the bike with bill and um those days i can remember every ride i did with him because I learned a lot. Um, he had a lot of fun, enjoyed it. And there's a lot of days I don't remember those stages from the Tour of California or the US Pro Challenge race experience, but I remember every single one that I did with Bill Walton. That's awesome. That is awesome. Well, cool. Well, thank you everyone who did join us. Uh, thank you to uh, Coach Chris and Coach Renee for um, sharing their knowledge with us and uh, Corey for always being there in the background to set up and navigate through the, the complications as we go. But um, I look forward to doing this again personally, and uh, I hope we do it soon. Bye-bye. Thanks.